around 29%. And we all remember that the Arab Spring, in fact, in part begun because of red prices going very high. That is, of course, specific countries that we can point out. Then there is certainly the diplomatic issues, the political issues as well. Um, not all countries in the Middle East are necessarily only aligned to the United States or NATO. They also have good relations with, with the Russian Federation. What will they do now going forward as well? Let's discuss those issues now. We're joined by two esteemed panelists. We're joined by Professor Gilbert Ashkar, who is a professor of development studies and international relations at SOAS at the University of London. And we're also joined by a former Canadian ambassador to Pakistan, Egypt, and Indonesia, who is joining us today from Ottawa, Ferry Dukherkov. Ferry and Gilbert, thank you both for taking your time out to join us today here on BMTV's The Scope. Uh, Ferry, I'd like to start with you, if I may. Um, you had a lot of experience in the region, of course, uh, as I'm sure Gilbert has as well, certainly. But I wanted to start off right at the top with, in fact, firstly talking about Pakistan, because the Pakistani prime minister was actually in Moscow when this entire situation began. Is that symbolic in some ways, do you think, Ferry, of where this region as a whole, and I'm of course expanding it to include Pakistan and South Asia, stands at this time? Well, when you start talking about Pakistan, you have to look at the geostrategic interest of Pakistan, which is very closely allied to China, as we know. It's becoming, you know, the all-weather friend, even when I was there nearly 20 years ago. But it's also because China and Russia are very close. Uh, it is perfectly normal for Pakistan to not align itself, but be closer to Russia than it used to be. And the relationship between the US and Pakistan, which is always the ethereal subject that is raised time and again, the relations between the US and Pakistan are certainly not at its zenith uh, because of the, the failure of the withdrawal from the, the, the Taliban uh, yoke and what the Pakistani prime minister, my old friend Imran Khan, has decided to have a much more positive policy toward the Taliban, which I think that from a local interest is legitimate and even from a strategic position is interested when you look at the waning, the waning place of the U.S., globally, for countries like Pakistan, there's a need to reassess how its own interests are better placed. And so it's not surprising that Imran Khan was in Russia. Now, do we expect condemnation of what goes on? I think all those reactions are fairly tepid. Uh, you've noticed even India has also been quite tepid about its denunciation of what's going on. We have, in fact, a major strategic change throughout the world, and the countries like Pakistan and India are, and others around are reassessing what does it mean for them. When you have the, the center of gravity, despite the conflict that we're watching, shifting from the Atlantic to the Pacific, in fact, for a Pakistani, Ukraine is an outlier, and it's destabilized, but it doesn't impact as much as, of course, for, for the Europeans in C2. I think that one has to look at the broad strategic uh, perspective to start with. Gilbert, let, let me bring you in then. On, on in the Arab countries, and you know, we've seen the Arab League statement as well, um, worried about what is happening in that region. But it doesn't seem that there is, it doesn't seem that the Arab countries are taking one side or the other. Why is that, do you think? Well, because the the Arab countries have been developing uh, uh, ties with, with Russia, and that when I say the Arab countries, I don't mean uh, countries that have been traditionally uh, or that have held uh, close links with Russia traditionally, like Syria, obvious, the obvious most obvious case, uh, Syria, which which is the, the other war going on and for much longer time since 2015, where the rather Russian uh, military intervention. Um, but uh, even countries that were traditionally in the, the U.S. camp uh, have developed uh, uh, ties with, uh, with Russia. Russia, since its intervention in, in Syria, has uh, sold itself in the region um, as the, 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 the most reliable uh, defender of the old regime, or the, or the ancien regime, the old system in the region. Uh, they did it, uh, and they, they defend the existing system, whatever its uh, uh, orientation, if you want. 
whether it is uh, the, the Syrian Ba'ath uh, regime uh, or, or they, 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 they built uh, very uh, positive relations with uh, General Abdel uh, Fattah al-Sisi, uh, the Egyptian dictator. They have close relations with the United Arab Emirates, which is uh, at the, 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 the spearhead of, 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 uh, of, of reaction to, to, the, to any progressive movements in the region. They, they, they have now developed close links with the Sudanese military. And actually, uh, the worst uh, uh, figure of these militaries, the, the head of the genocidal militias uh, of, of Darfur, who became, became a key, a senior figure in the, in the military government in Sudan, yeah. uh, just visited uh, Vladimir Putin the first, uh, on, during the first day of the invasion of Ukraine. So uh, you've had all this. And uh, one reason for that is that the, the defeat of the United States in Iraq uh, uh, has, uh, um, com I mean, combined with the, the the intervention, the successful intervention, if we can call this success, of course, from 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 the, from their point of view, the successful yes. intervention of Russia in Syria, have made all these countries quite wary, quite uh, afraid. Uh, these regimes, these monarchies, and therefore uh, looking at the, the the relation with with Russia as you know a way of uh, of uh, hedging their their bets and. Uh, mm safeguarding their, their future. They, they, are, they don't feel any longer that the US protection is reliable. It's not reliable in their view. And that's, that's why they, they, they also develop links with Russia. So then, Ferry, will countries in the region then be able to figure out a way to balance this? Because you know, there's a lot on the table, right? There's energy, there's, as I mentioned, wheat. All of the above is really important to the region. I, I think there's a lot on all the countries in the world's plate, but I think that for the for the Arab countries, the issue is first of all safeguarding their oil and gas interest, and therefore to what extent, in order to compensate for the shortage of supply from Saudi from from Russia, I mean, uh, what arrangement can be made? What leverage do the oil producer? in the region have with the West, uh, and, and I think it's quite a high leverage. At the same time, it cannot show itself to be too complacent with the West desire because of the relationship with Russia and OPEC. So I, I think there's going to be a, a, a balancing act. But at the end of the day, if even if you go back to 1973, in the short term, countries benefit from the very large increase in price. But that doesn't mean that the region will be more stable. So I think the long view is much more, let's hope for all the countries that this crisis in Ukraine settles rapidly rather than more convoluted, extended and all that. But the, the, the set of sanctions that have been taken are going to play out. And I think for the next few months, there's a very few countries in the world that will actually have a sense of where, even particularly from an energy point of view, where are the prices going and what's their future. Gilbert, you know, there is this huge controversy, right, as you well know, at, at the United Nations, how the UAE voted at the recent session there, um, abstaining from the vote, in fact. Um, and that was, you know, there was controversy about, hey, the Russians and the UAE came to some sort of a deal behind the scenes. Both sides have denied that, though. Um, do you think that there may have been a deal? Is that what the UAE is worried about at this time? To whom are you addressing the question, please? Uh, it's for you, Gilbert. Okay, please. I don't speak if I'm not uh, asked directly because that yeah. might create problems. Um, yeah, I mean, the UAE, as I said, have developed uh, uh, collaboration actually with Russia. They intervened together uh, along with Egypt in Libya uh, where you have uh, Russian troops, so-called uh, private militias, but no, no, no one is fooled. I mean, the Wagner uh, uh, forces are actually uh, Russian. Uh, I mean, Russian government uh, forces. They they serve the, the purposes of the Russian government, and they have, they have been uh, all three of them backing uh, Khalifa Haftar in in Libya. Uh, this uh, uh, military leader who wanted to create a. Re recreate a dictatorship in Libya. 
um, and uh, so you have had this this collaboration. I mentioned Sudan, both the UAE and Russia are close friends of the uh, Sudanese military. So I'm not surprised at all that the UAE would abstain uh, at uh, the uh, Security Council. As for the Saudi Kingdom, uh, we have to remember that uh, 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 Vladimir Putin was uh, uh, very friendly with Mohammed bin Salman after the assassination of uh, Jamal Khashoggi. So uh, when the, the whole world, and especially the, the, the West, including the United States, had uh, you know, had uh, this uh, strong outcry against this assassination, except for Donald Trump, who, who very close friends with the Saudi Saudis. <laughs> the 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 when when you had all that, uh, uh, Putin, uh, you know, uh, was very friendly and uh, you know, uh, had a completely different attitude towards uh, Mohammed bin Salman. So again, the the, the Saudis don't want to. Uh, to jeopardize this kind of relation, and they have shifted. In 2014, the Saudi kingdom was engaged in, an, in a war on oil prices against Russia and against Iran. Today, it is working hand in hand with Russia. So you, you, you've had a complete shift in this in this regard. All right, Gilbert, uh, I'm going I'm to cut in because we have to go to break very soon. But I, I do want to ask both of you to stay on. And in fact, I'm glad you mentioned Iran as well, Gilbert, because I want to, in fact, discuss the Iran nuclear deal um, and what kind of effect this may very well possibly have on that deal as well. And of course, other issues when it comes to the MENA region. We'll be right back after this break here on Human TV, continuing this discussion here on the scope. Please stay tuned with us. Welcome back, everyone, here on The Scope with me, Wakar Rizvi, on BMTV. We're continuing to discuss the effects that the war on Ukraine is having and will have in the near future on the MENA region. And we're continuing to dis discuss this with our esteemed panelists, Peri Dekherkov and Gilbert Ashkar, um, both of them joining us from London and Ottawa, respectively. Uh, Ferry, I'd like to start off with you in this segment. And right before going to break, in fact, Gilbert mentioned the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA. What kind of an effect will this have, if at all, right? Because the Iranians have already been given a deadline just very recently, in fact, and they're not happy about that. Will the situation in Ukraine change all of that? I think there's going to be a serious slippage in any negotiation regarding Iran. And the question is, to what extent the Iranian looking at what goes on would not be tempted to actually put aside the whole negotiation before they see what the outlook comes out, because Iranian are long-termist and, uh, and, and an, an, an unstable situation where you have Putin talking about nuclear readiness and all that. If I'm an Iranian leader, I'm saying, hey, 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 maybe I should not abandon right away all of that, and maybe I can heighten the price of me returning to Iran deal. I think the situation is pretty negative for Iran. No, I mean, for the, for the Western and the Iranian negotiation, I don't see anything positive coming out of that. The delay will be taken advantage of by the Iranian regime to further their enrichment, I would assume, and, and stake a larger price for returning to the, to the deal. So I think we're going into yet another very unstable relationship. Uh, Gilbert, if I may bring you back into the conversation, you had mentioned the Saudi angle before, Gilbert, but I also wanted to bring in the Qatari angle as well as the Saudis. So on both of those points, a lot of people are saying that both of those countries have a lot of leverage right now, um, especially when it comes over the issue of, of energy supplies, right? So if energy supplies are to stop, uh, at least yeah. within the Ukraine slash Russia region, the Qataris and the Saudis would have leverage over the rest of the world in that regard. Will they play that part? Yeah, well, actually, uh, they they will be uh, very closely uh, watching what what is happening. Uh, if, uh, if, uh, if 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 Russia uh, uh, is put on the defensive and in a weakening position. Uh, the the pressure on the Saudis to uh, to act to uh, you know to, uh, uh, to 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 bring more oil on the market and therefore bring the oil prices down 
uh, will will be very high. As for Qatar, it is uh, completely uh, willing to collaborate. I mean, even Joe Biden uh, wanted to or gave uh, uh, Qatar the, the status of special relation with NATO. Uh, Qatar is uh, increasing its uh, or wants to increase its exports of uh, of uh, uh, liquefied gas to uh, to to Europe. It offered uh, to do that, and it's taking measures to do that. Actually, even Algeria, which is a country that had traditionally a rather good relation with Russia, uh, has offered to increase its gas exports to, to Europe because they are interested in getting larger parts of the European markets. This is their more, especially the Algerian or the Libyans, this is their more natural market because it's the closest to their, to, 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 to their countries. And, uh, and so that, that, will, that will definitely happen. So the, the, the only issue here is the, the, the Saudi position, which has been one of refusing even some pressure by the US administration recently to, to increase oil, to increase their oil production and oil export. And uh, if they see that uh, um, uh, uh, Moscow is, is, is in dire straits in, 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 after what, what it did, they, they will definitely go back to their old policy of, uh, of uh, 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 acting on the oil market in, in, in a way that suits uh, Washington. Um, Gilbert, we're getting a comment as well. We have a couple of viewer comments coming in live as, as we're speaking with you as well. Um, and one of them, Gilbert, has asked in a sense, and it's a rhetorical question really, but it's about a World War III. Um, from your vantage point, and do you think from the Middle East vantage point that there is a worry about this becoming a lot bigger than it currently is? Well, I would say that not only the Middle East, every part of the world should be extremely worried about, uh, uh, you know, uh, these uh, the talks about uh, nuclear uh, or nuclear armament. Uh, the, 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 the step taken by Vladimir Putin to, to put his nuclear forces on alert is, is really uh, foolish. I mean, th this, is, this is really so someone who has lost contact with reality, who believed uh, Probably that uh, his uh, excursion in, uh, in in Ukraine would be very easy, and the population would greet uh, uh, Russian tanks there with flowers. Or he probably believed something like that. And seeing himself so so much wrong about this, he he is just uh, uh, running in into the wall with, with with such crazy views. You know, the, speaking of nuclear, uh, the use of nuclear weapons. Um, of course, uh, uh, on the other hand, you have people uh, that uh, I've read uh, just uh, today an article by a former, former uh, US uh, and NATO commander, uh, a, gen a certain general breed love. He could have been called strange love, actually, because he, he was uh, calling for a no flight zone over Ukraine, which means what? Which means that uh, NATO countries would shoot down. Uh, 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 Russian planes over Ukraine. And that's, that's completely insane because that would lead us straight into a, uh, uh, World War III. And World War III would be the last, you can be sure of that, the last World War because, that, uh, because there would be no humanity after. Given I wonder, the, I wonder, the, Gilbert. You know, as this, as this continues over this time, if, if I may, I I wonder what will be the priority for the MENA region going forward. In the sense, and I'm talking about these two things: pol politics and diplomacy, because you have to keep the the U.S. happy, at least for some of the countries who have been aligned to the U.S. in the past. Um, or will this be about more energy and and it, the economy. What do you think is at the top of the minds of the leadership of the region? I know it's it's hard to generalize. I mean, but of course, if we just talk about the Gulf countries, they may have their own priorities, but other countries like Lebanon or even Syria, if, if I may bring them in with their respective economic issues, um, this would be very, very tough, right? Uh, me? Or yes, it's for you, Gilbert. Yes, yes, yeah. it's for you. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I think that the, the priority from my point of view for the MENA region is to carry on the fight for democracy, to carry on the fight for, for a real democratic change, real change in the social economic uh, uh, systems that you have in, in that part of the world. That's the priority of priorities. And that, that struggle is going on. You've had the Arab Spring 2011, you've had a second wave in 2019, 
uh, the Sudanese are still fighting against the, the attempt at uh, uh, overthrowing uh, what they achieved in, in, 29, in 2019. So th that's where I would put the, the priorities because oil or not oil, this money, I mean, there have been, there, there are, every sovereign fund of these, of the, the oil monarchies, they have hundreds of, of billions of, uh, of US dollars. They have absolutely a huge, huge money, but they, this money they put outside, they don't put in the region, they don't invest in, in the de development of the region and the social and economic development in the region. And what you have is extreme uh, 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 wealth on, on one side and extreme poverty on the other side, and that can't go on. But then with all the money that you've mentioned, though, Gilbert, um, can the region ride it out? if there are global economic issues then, in the sense that there's a, if there is a global impact with all the very wealthy wealthy sovereign funds in the region, we can talk about Kuwait, for example, or the other sovereign funds, will they then you know, step up and support their own people and possibly the rest of the Middle Eastern countries? I don't think they will do. This would be very utopian to believe they will do. Uh, it's only by a movement from below that you can have that. That's why you have had this revolutionary, these revolutionary waves, 2011, 2019, and you will have certainly uh, more to come. What started in 2011 is a long-term revolutionary process, which is unfolding. The region is completely destabilized since 2011. And there is no way that it could go back to some form of despotic stability like that uh, existed uh, before before the year 2011. So that's the, the real problem for the region uh, in, in the long term and even in the immediate future. I wonder though, Gilbert, how long can the, the Middle East region uh, pretend to be neutral in this situation between Ukraine and Russia? Because I, I'm sure, I'm sure the United States is breathing down all of the top leadership's throats right now. Sure. Uh, they are very opportunistic, the, 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 the governments in the, in the region, and they are watching, as I said. If they see that uh, uh, Russia is losing ground, then they will, they will shift. They will uh, take, uh, you know, they, they will denounce the invasion and whatever you want. Uh, if they, on the other hand, if they see that Russia is, is, uh, is succeeding in, in achieving uh, some of its goals and aims, uh, they will remain in this... Uh, uh, kind of uh, neutral position, they wouldn't want to to uh, to, to uh, antagonize Russia, which is present in the region and which uh, is a country that that is ready to do business with them. And Russia is playing everybody. You know, it's playing on, on all registers. Like you know, Russia offers uh, the Iranians to sell them uh, airplanes. I mean, fighter fighter jets. And at the same time, offer to the Saudis uh, uh, anti-aircraft missiles, S-400. So that's very nice. You know, you, you send the poison on one and the antidote to the other. That's exactly what's happening. Uh, uh, so uh, these, uh, I mean, the, the, the key point will be how this war evolves. And most of the rest of the world will determine their position in light of that. And just very quickly, if you if you can, then Gilbert, um, what do you think that happens within within the week ahead? For example, when it comes to, as I said, of the United Nations and, and Arab votes, because even within the Arab League, I believe there is disagreement in that. So the likes of Kuwait do want to take a stronger stance yeah. against Russia. Well, some of the I mean, Kuwait uh, owes its existence as a state and as a regime to the yeah. United States. Okay, that's different from the United Arab Emirates, for instance. The United Arab Emirates were a British protectorate and, and they, they have no special debt, uh, moral debt yeah. or political debt to the United States. So it depends, each country is different. The Saudi kingdom has been yeah. traditionally very closely linked to, to Washington, but because- Gilbert, I, I apologize sincerely, I'm gonna cut you off. We're, we're quickly running out of time. I just wanted to say goodbye to yourself as well as Ferry de Ferfa, who had to leave us a bit earlier, but we appreciate, of course, Robert for his really important insight. Of course, viewers, thank you for watching as well. We were discussing the situation about Ukraine and Russia, and of course, it's a MENA region. Join me next week as well at the same time as we continue talks about international issues.